tell you, you're a big indie games guy. I'm I am happy. Oh, yeah. I am happy you're here, man. We're going to have oh, sweet. <laughs> ben is very screwed. Ben is going to hate this podcast. <laughs> I, I'm ben, pretty familiar the... with Minesweeper. If you guys have played that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that like old Minecraft? Yeah. I, Minecraft <laughs> yeah, is actually based on it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the it's beta two, Minecraft. It's 2D Minecraft. Yeah. It's actually funny when Minecraft started coming out. Like I, like I, I thought it was mine. Like I, I didn't know that was like a different game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like oh, it. Man. Well, you guys, it is September sixteenth, two thousand eighteen, and it's episode one hundred and sixty-two. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and we have one of our usuals. He's Ben Charles. How's it going? Hey, everybody. Ben, you're really not ready for this episode. You have three video game nerds, and you don't have Laurel or Megan <laughs> to like rally with. <laughs> that is true are you gonna be okay i'll be fine i've played halo a couple times that's true and brian nosny is back hey brian hey how's it going it's going good thanks for joining us awesome yeah well you guys our guest today really has his beginnings in jazz drums and vibraphone he's also classically trained and his projects and performances include of course classical percussion jazz of course and electronic music, rock, and popular music. He's performed around the U.S. and as far as Africa and Europe. He recently returned from Germany and a, a fairly recent performance at PAX East, which is a, a pretty big deal in the video game industry for sure. So I wanted to tell us all about that. And what else? He has appeared on television a number of times, having appeared on Ghanaian television, PBS, and NBC's America's Got Talent. Did I get all that right, Doug Perry? Yeah, man, I need to update my bio though. <laughs> <laughs> there's also there's also one word misspelled that I want you to go through and find. Oh no, <laughs> it's okay. It's, it. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to spot. Hearing that being read back to me is just. I was just thinking, man, I sound like such a nerd. Well, you know what? Hearing Casey tell you you spelled something wrong is really problematic, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Oh, that's good, Ben. That's good. Brian, how about a LaCroix meme? Oh, man. This is going to become a... This is a thing now, huh? No, this is a thing. This is one of your jobs. Yeah. This is one of my jobs? Yeah. All right. Um, we all have jobs. Uh, let's see. Um, I, I don't know which ones I've said already. Right. That's the... Uh, I think, I actually, think I found... The same the, actually, I, I read this one lately and la literally laughed out loud. Um, <laughs> LaCroix is proof that if you just hang out long enough, society will slowly accept you. <laughs> <laughs> oh no very good very good very good well doug man how's um yeah what what the heck was pax i guess that was a while ago maybe that's kind of old news now but I, I think a lot of us don't know what that is yeah so um pax is uh short for penny arcade expo it's kind of weird that it's called that penny arcade was a web comic that used to be on the internet back in the like the golden days of like the 2000s or so um before facebook ruined everything and uh it was it was just like a web comic about video games and i guess they decided to put together some sort of like video game related meetup that eventually just blew up into this huge expo and now it's a professional event where game companies from all over come to you know set up their booths showing off their most recent games or games that they currently have in development um there are tons of vendors that are selling games and game related paraphernalia um, is there are thousands of people there? I think like sixty to seventy thousand people were at the most recent one. Um, I can't remember exactly. It's big enough that there are a number of them. There's Pax East, which happens in Boston, Pax South, which happens in Texas, and then uh, they call it Pax Prime. But the original Pax happens in Seattle, and actually, I think that one takes up like three different buildings in Seattle. So it's a yeah, it's a pretty big thing. But yeah, I was invited to play there. As part of the uh, the MAGFest Jam Space. So MAGFest is another video game convention that's centered around music that started this interesting tradition of having a jam room, which was just a room at the convention that was set up with instruments that people could freely come in and play. So you'd go in, there'd be like a drum set, maybe like a couple guitars, bass, a couple microphones. And uh, the idea was to just, you know, get people, strangers to like, you know, try playing stuff together and... Uh, it became a very popular thing. Um, they even started like putting on small shows in that in that space, and uh, the idea of having a jam space became like a pretty popular uh, and attractive feature for a lot of these other conventions. So PAX adopted it. They had MacFest come up and have a jam space there, 
And part of what they do when they go to a convention like PAX is they'll have blocks of time for the general public to come in and play. And then shows that uh, various guests will perform. So I went up and did a marimba recital at one of these blocks for, for a show up there. About an hour's worth of video game music on marimba. Wow, very cool. So we hear about musicians and especially young musicians and percussionists all the time that either want to compose or they got into the classical side of music because they're interested in gaming. I mean, I know when I was a kid, it's like, man, the soundtrack to Final Fantasy VII was like so cool. Oh, and yeah. from then on, it's like I'm a loyal follower of that composer who I, I can't think of the name of. Uh, Nobu Ematsu. Yeah, thank you, thank you. You know, so I mean, that was, that, that was a really... Anyway, that's a very impactful thing for a lot of young people. And But you found a way to blend this hobby with your other hobby. I mean, we all have kind of our hobby as our career, but you have, you've found a way to merge the two uh, in a really cool way. How, how do you do that and what, what all do you do? Because I know you do a lot of other things involving game music, right? Yeah, so I guess the the whole reason that came about, um, I I got my first Sega Genesis when I was like five years old. Um, and my parents still reflect that that was the uh, worst parenting decision they ever made. <laughs> um, which I guess I can sympathize with now that I, you know, now that I'm a teacher and I kind of see the other side of it, <laughs> I, you know, they told me that, and, uh, there was a part of me that was pretty stubborn about the idea that that just had to be the case that I had to live my life knowing that I wasted all this time playing video games as a kid and that it wouldn't lead to anything productive. So I don't know, I think around, uh, you know, the end of high school, beginning of college, I realized, well, okay, the two things that I care about most in my life um, when it comes to like the things that I'm doing or my hobbies are, you know, being a percussionist and being a gamer. So how can I put these two things together? I found this website called Overclocked Remix that I became a part of, which was one of the first very popular websites devoted to the arrangement, reinterpretation or remixing of game music. And uh I I was super into it. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And I was trying to, I tried to like make my own remixes. I found that website when I was maybe like a sophomore in high school or something like that. And it wasn't until I was a sophomore in college that I actually mustered up the skill set to produce something that they would accept and post. And uh, I don't know. I think once, once Overclocked Remix hit me, I was, my, my fate was sealed that I would be involved in this world of game music arrangement and whatnot. And then once, uh, you know, I went through school not really being able to be much of a gamer because I had to, you know, practice and whatnot. But um, when I got out of school, I guess one of the first things that, you know, went through my mind was, oh, great. Now I have all this time where I can, like, play video game music again. So I I just started uh, trying to um, I just started I made, started making YouTube videos or trying to make arrangements for marimba. Um, and it wasn't long before one of my friends from Overclocked Remix who was on that website as well as a, an arranger and more of a hobbyist had by that point become a, a very well-known video game composer. His name was Wilbert Roger. He uh, was in-house at LucasArts scoring Scar uh, Star Wars games and had just recently left that position and said, hey, I'm working on this game from the Laura Croft franchise and there's a level that I want to just be like all percussion and would you be interested in recording stuff for that? And I went, oh my God, yeah. So... <laughs> That was, I think that was probably like the the point where I actually started being involved in the game industry. I recorded uh, for him in that game. And then um, after that, there were a couple other games that popped up, including uh, Guild Wars 2, um, a game called Super Lucky's Tale, which is like Microsoft's version of Mario. I did Civilization 6 pretty recently. And then a few smaller indie games as well. Uh, most recently, a game called Fossil Hunters, which thanks to uh, Camille Saint-Saëns, apparently... Uh, fossils sound like xylophones and marimbas so that was really that was really great <laughs> well it's it's funny like talking about video games and video game music because actually one of the biggest reasons that i got into classical music and i can still remember this is probably around the time i was in second grade i was playing earthworm gym 2 on super nintendo and oh, there was yeah. a level called the villi people and the soundtrack on that level was actually moonlight sonata <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know that that was Beethoven. I just knew that I liked it. And I, I don't know, right. somehow my, I told my mom I liked that music. And I think I got like a cassette tape of Beethoven piano sonatas or something like that. But that was my uh, introduction to classical music, really, I would say. Um, and it's been interesting for me as so, someone sort of on the periphery of all this. I'm not super uh, 
active in this like Doug is, but I had a gig in December playing, um, what was it called? Zelda Symphony of the Goddesses back in Florida, mm-hmm. where it's like a, a Zelda show with a, you know, projection and a click track and all the Zelda music. And it's interesting to me to think that the, like Koji Kondo, who I know does a lot of the Nintendo music, Zelda and Mario, uh, mm-hmm. he wrote the original Mario Brothers song that everyone knows, and he's still composing music for them today. And Mm -hmm. the music today sounds so much more advanced, and I'm sure it's partially because technology is so much more advanced. And I know also in looking at um, new markets for universities as far as composition, video game composition is is always on the list of actually like emerging markets. So I guess my question for Doug and also Brian is like, how has this stuff changed composition over the years? Oh man. Well, first of all, I want to say, uh, you know, the, uh, Zelda symphony, I've, I've played the show a number of times as well. Actually, it's not impossible that when you played it, you might've seen some of my markings in some of the parts. <laughs> um, but man, so, uh, I mean, video game composition has or like early video game composition has had like a hugely influential effect on, um, not just, uh, not just mo- like modern video game composition, but I think just like classical composition in general, because, um, we've had all of these tropes that have evolved out of what was essentially at that time, technological limitations. I think, uh, you bringing up Koji Kondo is great because that's a great example of somebody who got his job because he was a computer programmer or that's what he studied in school. And he had like I think he had like a minor in music or that he was he was heavily involved in the school's music program. And he just saw an ad in the paper from Nintendo that was looking for a programmer who could program music. And he was like, oh, that seems like a good fit for me. You know, so these guys were not they weren't composing music with pencil and paper, you know, using sheet music and orchestrating the way that composers do now. They were um, they were programming in letters and numbers and uh, writing in code and having to write in code in a way that could be musically fluent. So even in like, uh, you, you know, talking about the Mario theme, when you listen to that, you're listening to uh, an NES sound chip, which means that you have five different channels of audio. You have three uh, tonal channels, so that's two sine waves and a triangle wave. One of those tonal channels was able to do portamento, the other one was not. Um, then you had a white noise or a, uh, yeah, white noise channel, which was used for percussion most of the time. Um, and then a small sampling channel where you could sample an audio or sample audio, which means record real audio and put it in there. It's just that you, that wasn't very big. So that's why if, when you play like the original Mario if, or like Mario three, for example, and you hear like this really, really bad, like timbale sample, that's, that's what that channel is. But, um, so with under these like very strict technological limitations, they had to be able to make the most out of it. Especially when we start, started to get games like Mario, where they really started using the, the technology as much as they could. So examples include if you wanted a chord, um, but you only have three voices for which you can write in, one solution to that was a very rapid arpeggiation, which um, I think we, if you think about the, the sound effect that plays when Mario gets the mushroom, he gets bigger. That's an example of that very, very rapid arpeggiation. But you hear this used to like sustain a chord, where it's basically an easy way of getting a three-part harmony or whatever you're looking for with only one voice just because it's moving so quickly. And you hear that effect all the time nowadays, even in like commercial pop music, especially. Groups that try to do like this, the techno chiptune crossover effect in their music, you're going to hear that sound all the time. Same reason that when you're playing Mario and you're jumping, the jump sound is just a portamento sine wave, which means that one of the other audio channels has to go away. So you have to be careful which channel you choose to put that in. And then even in the percussion, like if you wanted to have a kick drum, that was a uh, a that was the white noise channel with like a high note that had a that very quickly um, uh, bent down to a low pitch. So the the attack filter had to be super fast on that in order to create the effect of actually hitting uh, kick drum. So a lot of the way that that early video game music sounded was only composed that way to deal with the very strict technological limitations. But if you listen to modern game music, a lot of um, a lot of games still use a lot of those techniques or even orchestrate <laughs> those techniques. You know, there's no longer a restriction that enforces us to have to do that, but you still will actually, I mean, you just still hear it anyway, you know. It's become kind of a timeless sound, I guess you could say, in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting hearing a lot about like the the limitations and how it forced creativity. And we've talked about that before. 
But I just had a quick little tidbit to share um, in my music appreciation class. I guess it was this past week we were talking about uh, electronic music, computer music. And of course, Paul Lansky comes up with that a lot, him being a sort of pioneer of it. And Mm -hmm. uh, I had a a cool little personal experience in that I was like doing research and Paul Lansky was using an IBM 360 model 91 computer back in Mm -hmm. the 70s. (laughs) And I found like uh, a picture of it online, like the computer that he was using. And it's like that computer that's the size of the room. And then right. I read the I read the caption and it says this like this terminal is now on display at the Museum of Computer History in uh, San Francisco, California. Or I think it's Palo Alto. But, uh, and I was there this past summer and I saw that very panel from that picture I was looking at. In the oh, museum. wow. So, yeah. oh, that's amazing. So if you ever find yourself in the San Francisco Bay Area, go check out the uh, Computer History Museum. They have a little section on computer music they have a little section on video games for that matter too and they have that panel that paul lansky was using but sorry go ahead brian well i was just it's funny you bring that up that idea of limitations making you more creative when um uh given that you and i are both university of miami alumni uh i remember the first one of the first classes i went to was with uh raul murciano who was the uh i don't know if he still is but he was the director of the media writing and studio composition program I'm back when I was not sure, there. but he's definitely still there. Yeah. Okay. And he, one of the things he said, you know, I mean, a lot of people looked at that as like, oh, that's the jingle writing program, right? Uh-huh. And stuff like that. Uh-huh. And, and he, he talked about the very first class. He was just like, you know, a lot of people are just like, oh man, how can you, how can you compose like that? Like there's so many limitations, like, oh, it's got to be like a minute and a half long and it's got to be in this style and all these things. And, and it mm-hmm. like, it really resonated with me because he was like, no, that's, that's the perfect way for me to write because one, it shows me how big my sandbox is that I can play in. Yeah. And then two, it forces me to get as creative as possible with just those tools and stuff. And I was just like, wow, that's 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 a guy that really knows his stuff right there. Yeah, and I yeah. think along those lines, I think I've used the example before of like, sometimes there's such thing as like too much creativity, too much free space. Like mm-hmm. if I said, oh, I want you to, you know, create a piece of art to represent the loss felt by the American people on September 11th. It's like, all right, so I can make a sculpture. I can write a piece of music. I can do a painting. I can write a poem, you know, like as opposed to I need a nine minute piece for unaccompanied solo trumpet. Then that's like already like a great limitation to have that can channel your energy somewhere. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. Uh, you guys might be surprised to know I have programmed music on a Commodore 64 before. Oh, nice. Oh man. Sweet. Did you guys did you guys have Commodore 64s? Anybody? <laughs> My parents no. wouldn't buy one for me. I wanted one. We had two. Somehow oh. we had two. But that that one? reminds me, John John Mackey had a good blog post a while ago about how he started composing, and it was like I might have been a Commodore 64 or something similar, but anyway, there was like this like very narrow window of time. I was fascinated that like there was like this gaming machine that was out and he used it to compose music and like learn how to compose music. And basically I had the thought if he was a year older or a year younger, like that would have never happened with John Mackey. Mm -hmm. And John Mackey is known as like the the composer that doesn't play an instrument because that's how he learned music was like Mm -hmm. in putting notes and seeing what it sounded like. And again, like a lot of the limitations we're talking about, came up in his music and that's why he said so much of his music has ostinatos in it is because like he can only program things a certain way and he just sort of got used to that style yeah and you know there are a lot of composers that uh i I mean i i know i know many composers who got started composing that type of music there's a there's a big movement um called known as like chiptune music that that's happening like kind of tangentially in the video game music world where people obtain the hardware or obtain the emulators that you know, the Game Boy or the NES or the Sega Genesis or whatever used, and they write original music that way. And I mean, similar to how you might see a DJ perform, these guys will put on entire shows where it's just them on stage with their Game Boy plugged into the sound system. And they'll be like inputting things and programming things the same way like a DJ will be doing a show with a set of turntables. It's really cool stuff. You guys ever have Mario Paint? Oh, oh I, I never Mario. had it, but I played it. <laughs> oh, that, that's like a Mario big like online. Paint. Actually, wait, too. this this is great. I'm so, sorry to, to jump in like that, but actually, it's a great example because I have a friend who's uh, getting a degree in composition right now uh, in Canada. I can't remember exactly where. Um, who started composing in Mario Paint? Yeah, oh, I that love, was I love where he Mario started. Paint. Yeah, Mario Paint was so great. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the fact for those of you who don't know, it was this weird old, I mean, Super Nintendo era game. 
that came with a mouse, a little mm-hmm. mouse pad, and it, could, it might have come with a little drawing, like, trackpad. Yeah, I but, think so. I think it did, but yeah, we, yeah. we had it, and you could you could open up the paint program, but you could also open up the composition program, mm-hmm. and it would give you a little staff, like a mushroom made this sound, and a star made a sparkle sound, and yeah, the, the little Mario fire flower and made a different sound, and wherever you arranged those, you'd have your, your music, yeah. and of course, it was in some kind of step sequencer, so like, your rhythm couldn't be <laughs> wrong, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah, the, there's an online version of that that you can use now. Um, that's like it's basically an emulation of the same program, but it's much more fleshed out. So you can have more. You can actually have the full gamut of accidentals and uh, mm. be more rhythmically accurate and all that stuff. I guess it says a lot about notation, though. I mean, they figured out that a great way to indicate timbre is just what the note literally looks like. Is the sound going to be like a fire flower or is it going to be a Yoshi, <laughs> right. you know? <laughs> I do remember the star was like a little pinging high sparkly sound. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think it just goes to show, you know, that like good music is good music. It doesn't matter whether it's symphony orchestra or five channels on an NES or what. I'm, I, a few summers ago, I had the... Uh, the poor idea to try and beat every Mario game over oh. the summer. I failed Holy miserably. Moly. I didn't even make it past two because um, I'm just really bad at games as much as I love them. But um, Same. But uh, one of the um, – oh, man, I'm totally forgetting what my – oh, I ended up posting like on Facebook at some point. I was like, I'm just going to say it. The, super, the original Super Mario Brothers theme is one of the most influential and greatest pieces of music ever written. And oh, yeah. it just is. Yeah. Just about everyone on this planet – knows that song and mm-hmm. and it's so good and so iconic i mean it's just i hope i write any something half as good one day <laughs> yeah no it's it's absolutely true it's it's incredible how there i don't think there's a single person on this planet who doesn't know that theme you know mm-hmm. um, it's funny it, it's funny you, you say that just now because this morning i was listening to a, a, a similar similar thing on NPR about Twisted Sisters, we're not going to take it and how everyone knows that it's in other languages and it's so Mm -hmm. far beyond. So yeah, it made it into NPR's like anthem category or something. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah. Well, anyway, it's a, yeah, piece of music that's transcended its own genre. Sorry, Ben, I think you have something there. It's so like the thing that Brian just said about like good music transcends genre We'll, we'll get to this uh, name a little bit later in this podcast, but Nadia Boulanger, who was one of the most ah. influential and famous composition teachers of the 20th century, she said the exact same thing, like, good music is good music. It doesn't matter if it's, mm-hmm. quote unquote, pop music or art music or what. And like, if you look at her former students, which I have a list of them somewhere, um, some of her former students include like Elliot Carter. Uh, Aaron Copeland and Quincy Jones, like what a what yeah. a mix. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, of course, yeah. Piazzolla as well. You know, yeah. she, she wasn't going to knock him for doing tango. You know. Well, in fact, that's that's who I was going to bring up because you know, apparently, my understanding is Piazzolla went and he wanted to be you know a, a a a classical composer type of thing, and she basically said like, listen, why don't you just like you write all these tangos? Why don't you just be the greatest tango composer? Yeah. that ever lived and that and he took it and ran with it and there you go yeah. i love teaching transcriptions yeah. of that stuff because as i'm working with like you know oftentimes the we'll have a marimba student play like the guitar part or heart part or whatever it was originally written for mm-hmm. and i I, I, I get distracted because i like try to be helping i'm trying to help them with like a sticking or something and i'm just like but look how good this counterpoint is can you believe how good this <laughs> counterpoint is the yeah. kids kind of looking at me like what is going on <laughs> like how can that be good i don't get how that I don't get how that can be ranked good or bad. It's just, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, it's great. You, you mentioned Nadia Boulanger because um, um, her one of, another one of her students, if you guys know the music of George Walker, he just died, I guess, last month. Mm. Mm. Um, but I, I didn't know his music until I saw the story. And uh, yeah, part of his bio was that he's a, he's a Nadia, another, yet yeah, another Nadia student that's super, super famous. But man, George Walker's music is just gorgeous so um anyway i should i should report on him at some point um uh, properly later but uh ben why don't you uh why don't you give us a little break from all this tech talk yeah well <laughs> speaking of nadia boulanger students <laughs> um uh-huh. i actually years ago my first exposure to doug was uh coming across his recording of dances of earth and fire by peter Klatzow. 
Um, oh, and I remember, I think it was either a blog entry or maybe it was just like a little YouTube description. You talked about uh, seeing Jihei Jung play it and it inspired you so much. So I wanted to get into some Peter Klatsow and then hear your thoughts on his music. Because I know you've played more than just that. I've seen some some YouTube videos. Um, but anyway, uh, if you're if you're interested in more information about Peter Klatsow, there's a couple dissertations that have, that cover some of his music. Um, Ejen Fangs, who we've discussed many times, uh, covers some Peter Klatsow. Most of the information I have today is from Daniel Higney's dissertation from Louisiana State University. Um, I didn't write down the year it was, but it, I think it was 2014 or something like that, relatively recent. So just a little bit of background about Peter Klatsow. He was born in a small mining town in South Af Africa called Springs on July 14th, 1945. He started his musical studies at around five years old at the Roman Catholic convent of St. Imelda in Brackpan, which I looked up on a map is about 20 minutes away. So still so small South Africa, kind of mining town area. He was awarded a scholarship by the South African Music Rights Organization in 1964 to study at the Royal College of Music in London, and he accepted. And part of the terms of this were that after he studied, he would return to South Africa, which we'll get to later. But his teachers at the Royal Conservatory, sorry, Royal College of Music included Bernard Stevens was his composition teacher. Kathleen Long was his piano teacher. And Gordon Jacob, who he studied orchestration with. While he was a student, he entered the Royal Philharmonic Composition Competition, and he became the youngest prize winner ever for his variations for orchestra. After graduating, he studied in Italy. And then after that, he went and studied in Paris with Nadia Boulanger, who we were just mentioning. And like I said, I had a list. Some of her other former students, just to give you an idea of the diversity of her output, included, of course, Peter Klatzow, Daniel Barenboim, Elliot Carter, Philip Glass, Quincy Jones, and Astor Piazzolla. So, yes, quite the... Uh, gamut there. <laughs> um, after that, he returned to South Africa in 1966, where he worked for the South African Broadcasting Corporation. I'm assuming some sort of musical post there, but I didn't sp specifically see that listed online. And then in 1973, he was appointed to the South African College of Music in Cape Town. And uh, as the years went by, in 1986, he was actually elected a fellow of the University of Cape Town for having performed original distinguished academic work of such quality as to merit special recognition. Their words, not mine, obviously. And he's one of the few South African composers to achieve huge international recognition. And it sort of reminds me a lot of John Sathis with New Zealand, sort of being like a, a cultural musical hero of that country. As far as percussionists are concerned, I think the name that comes up most often with Peter Klatzow is Robert Van Sys, who he works closely or who he has worked with closely for many years. And Robert Van Sys has a story about when Robert Van Sys, I think, was the timpanist with the Cape Town Symphony. He asked, uh, I want to have someone compose a work for me. Who should I who should I see? And he was directed to go knock on Peter Klatzow's door. And he literally knocked on the door and, you know, introduced himself as, hi, I'm Robert Van Sys and I play the marimba sort of deal. And Peter Klatzow agreed to write a work for him. And that work was his 1985 Concerto for Marimba. But before he wrote that, he wrote sort of a test piece called Figures in a Landscape for Flute and Marimba in 1984. That is uh, definitely a standard in the marimba repertoire. He's also been commissioned by Evelyn Glennie and the King Singers to write a song cycle for Voices and Marimba. We will come back to that later. And he's worked with several other big name percussionists, inclu including Kuni Komori and Tatiana Koleva. Um, let's see here. Uh, his big, I, I made a list of all of his sort of percussion centric works. There are some other, for example, he has a chamber concerto that includes a marimba part. Um, but I wanted to try and stick with the things you might see on maybe percussion recitals. So his percussion works are Figures in a Landscape that I already mentioned and the Concerto for Marimba that I already mentioned, Dances of Earth and Fire, which is from 1987 for solo marimba, also written for Robert Van Sice. That's a two-movement work. Uh, there's a double concerto from 1993 for flute, marimba, and strings, which was also written for Robert Van Sice, Leslie Shields, and the Cape Town Symphony Orchestra. Ambient Resonances, Echoes of Time and Place from 1994 for vibraphone and marimba. Uh, he has a about a three-minute work called Inyanga for solo marimba from 1996. Uh, in 1997, he has a work called Return of the Moon for male choir and marimba, and that was the one that was commissioned and recorded by Evelyn Glennie and the King Singers. 
He has a work from 1999 called Song for Stephanie. He was planning on writing six etudes for marimba for Evelyn Glennie. And uh, it sounds like the project just sort of fell apart. And that was supposed to be one of the etudes. And so he just retitled it uh, as Song for Stephanie and left it as its own piece. He has a sonata for violin and marimba from 2001. He has a piece called Prayers of Dance and Praise from Africa for Marimba Duo from 2002, which I've never heard, but now I want to. He has a piece that is uh, Six Concert Etudes for Marimba from 2010. And this was the sort of follow-up to that previously mentioned failed uh, project. It was commissioned by a consortium of 10 players organized by Daniel Daniel, uh, Higney. And this commission, uh, this consortium included Svet Stoyanov, Jude Traxler, Gwen Dees, and several others. Uh, one thing that I like about this piece in particular is that the first movement is for two mallets, which if you're the sort of Gene Kaczynski type also that likes to still play two mallets, I think that's a cool thing. He has a piece called Variations on a Theme of Paganini for Two Marimbas that uh, Doug here has recorded. He has a piece called Asinato Lament in Moto Perpetuo from 2011 for percussion ensemble of nine players that was commissioned by Brett Dietz in LSU. Uh, he has a piece called Variations on an Uncomposed Kyrie from 2013, A Sense of Place from 2013 also for Marimba and Cello, a concerto for vibraphone, marimba, and strings from 2013, and a concerto for two marimbas from 2013. So it seems like 2013 was a busy year. So that's yeah. sort of a, a fire hose of information about Peter Klatzel. Uh-huh. So uh, like I said, Doug, I know you've recorded at least a couple of his works. And I wanted to mention also that Dances of Earth and Fire in particular has, it's sort of based on octatonic scales, which having mm-hmm. played the piece also myself is a, is a trip if you're not used to that. And it sort of has, I think, almost like a Bartok vibe to it. So uh, yeah. what's your Peter Klatzel experience been like, Doug? Man, so it's uh, it's been uh, it's been cool hearing you say all this because I you know I haven't actually played a Klatzo piece in quite a while now so it's kind of like taking a trip down memory lane of like oh right that piece oh yeah, yeah I remember that piece you know uh, ambient resonances man I got to play that one you know like uh, when I was uh, at Peabody um, I heard a lot of Klatzo while I was there I was studying with Robert Van Sys and uh, you know that obviously you know he was very close to Klatzo's music given that he had worked with him for so long. Um, and, you know, it's pretty interesting when you think about it. I mean, Klatso, I guess, like, if I weren't to describe him as a marimba composer, I guess I would describe him as a choral composer. And uh, to have somebody like that come to marimba um, is really interesting. I, you know, I, I every once in a while, oops, every once in a while as a, a user of a popular website called Facebook.com, um, I will see... Uh, Klatso posts things here and there about you know his musical beliefs or philosophies and uh, one of the things I remember reading very early on was that he was very interested in taking the the quote unquote xylophone ness out of marimba, which I thought was an interesting like consideration. It wasn't something I'd really considered before, especially given that you know while I was in school and I still am a huge fan of Steve Reich and you know processed pattern based music, um, rhythmic music. I love groove oriented music and. Uh, but to to hear Klotza describe that kind of music as xylophone like was something I had not really considered before. But I guess if you listen to the first movement of Dances of Earth and Fire, there's nothing xylophone like about it. Um, and I think what was so great about studying that piece is that as a marimba player, it was one of the first times that I really had to think critically about color and timbre and sound quality, sound production while playing the instrument. There's nothing difficult about the first eight measures of the piece as far as how to play all of the notes and rhythms go. That's It's very slow. Um, you have some four-note chords. Maybe if you're like just starting out playing four mallets, it may be a little tricky for you. But the real challenge of executing that piece was to create the right ethos, the right atmosphere of what he, of what he was trying to express. Um, you know, Dances of Earth and Fire, you have, well, there are two movements. Um, one of the first one is, uh, dark and heavy. And the second one I, I think is, uh, con brio is the way that he, uh, uh, marks the expression there. So you have your dance of earth and your dance of fire, and you have to be able to encapsulate both of these characters in great contrast to one another. So uh, studying and playing and executing dances of earth and fire for me was all about how can I, what would like, what, what makes this earthy? What makes this grounded? You know, um, and uh, 
yeah, I, I found a lot of that came from timbre and just trying to figure out in that piece, like what, where's the gravity? What, what are the things that um, makes the sound like it's deep within the ground or deep or like d- deeply earthly. I guess um, the thing that I would always imagine while playing it is that maybe perhaps as the player, I was representing some sort of character that has been imprisoned or in, am in some way bound to some place. I don't know. And every and I'm constantly trying to get away from it. And every time I, I play like a, a fleeting marimba line, it starts to get me a little further away. But then you get that dark chord at the bottom which i think is like f b d e um he keeps going back to that as if it's just you know tugging on my chain to put me back in place and i i i thought that like that was such like a i don't know it was that that was the thing that made me like try to express this feeling of like grounded intense earthiness you know of course it's in like huge contrast to the Conbrio movement which i didn't get to play that that video that you saw that you uh referenced before was from my Senior recital in 2010. I can't believe it's been eight years Mm -hmm. since I played that and was there. I can't believe my hair is that long again. (laughs) But um, but we actually ended up cutting uh, the second movement from my program because he accidentally gave me too much music to play. And uh, I'm kind of glad he did because I I think I'm probably I probably would have crashed and burned if I tried to do the second movement as well. It's incredibly difficult. But of course, that one is a, such an opposite experience. That one has to be bright and fleeting and uh, and intense, but much more airborne, obviously, than the first movement. So once again, the, the contrast of sound quality is huge. And on top of that, now you actually have a piece that's like really, really difficult to execute. So I, I guess that was like the, the big thing that I got out of learning Klatso's music is that because this composer was approaching um, the marimba from a very non-percussion perspective, his writing makes me as a percussionist have to explore an aspect of music making that I don't always hear or don't always uh, get confronted with when I'm playing music that's written by either a percussionist or somebody who's very like intimately familiar with percussion. Yeah, it's interesting for me because I, playing that piece, which, by the way, I play both movements, not. <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> oh, there he goes. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Doug. No, uh, um, okay. but I, I would say I've never come across a piece that I dislike so much at the beginning of learning it and but yet at the end of it absolutely loved it like it totally totally changed me in that way um and then i remember that uh also taking lessons with svet on it svet talking about Uh studying it with bob van sice and svet said that like bob van sice is so so incredibly close to that music that like you walk up and you take a breath to play the first note and like before you even strike the keys, you okay, stop, stop, stop yeah. that's all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that happened to me a bunch of times. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, you're bringing me right back. Yeah, I mean, it's he, Bob had such like admiration and respect for that music. It, it was it was pretty intimidating studying it with him, honestly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, that, that's absolutely true. It's, it's funny you bring that up. I definitely remember... Many, many lessons where all I had to do was breathe and Bob already knew I was going to screw something up. <laughs> I guess that's those teachers. I have to say studying with Nancy was that way, too. And she she could turn it on and turn it off. Mm-hmm. I mean, and Laurel, Laurel can tell you about this also. I mean, you could just not get a beat before she had something to say if she wanted to. You know, yeah. If she was if she was mad at you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I think. um I, yeah, I was when you brought up that you had read something that I had written about the piece, I, I, I quickly had to like go through my like, quote unquote, archives. I remember that I had like back in uh, back in 2010, I was using Blogger. I was going to be the next blogger I didn't really keep up. But um, I, I, you know, I, I pulled up the, this old blog entry that I wrote about it. And uh, I think one of the I, I had a similar experience to you of when I first encountered the piece, I didn't really get it. Right. It just the, the octatonic language, it sounded strange. And uh, you really, you know, the, the experience of studying the piece made me begin to really love it and understand it. But I think that's because one of the really interesting successes of this piece and a lot of other pieces written like it is that these composers are kind of inventing their own forms of tonality through these other modes and languages where suddenly tension and release gets expressed not through one in five chords in the traditional tonal sense, but rather through their own sort of self self contextualized uh quote unquote harmonies you know um and yeah when i so when i first encountered it, i was just like oh was it, this piece is weird it's a bunch of random notes it's not nearly as good as the uh, uh, rhythm song which i think i was playing at the time um but you know I of course, like, like four or five years later oh yeah me too but <laughs> 
yeah, four or five years later, I reapproached and I was like, oh, wow, this is like serious, you know? Um, I wish that everybody that I performed for got to have the opportunity that I have or that I had of getting to spend so much time with the music and really getting to know it inside out. You know, when you perform, you really only get to give a snapshot of a piece. And, uh, you know, you can do your best to make that snapshot as clear as possible, put all your good filters on it, like, you know, put your hashtags in or whatever. But it's never really, it's not the same as, you know, you, you don't get to necessarily always show the entire process. I find it so interesting what, what Doug is saying about uh, sort of Peter Kletzel's approach to the marimba as a different instrument. And I was reading that he's actually, uh, until he I think until he wrote the six concert etudes, he actually avoided studying other people's marimba writing because he wanted to sort of have his own voice. And um, along those lines, one thing I found interesting is I think it was the 2000. 12, maybe it's 2014, but I think it was 2012 International Marimba Competition in Stuttgart. He was actually one of the judges. He was on the panel, which usually those things are, you know, the Nancy Zeltzmans and the Robert Van Sykes is not a composer. So I thought that was interesting. Mm. Yeah. And those, those, uh, those etudes, um, I mean, I, I, you know, obviously, I guess if you're going to write something like that, you probably want to investigate other repertoire. But I have to say, having played a couple of them, he, they really hit the nail on being technically challenging, but not um, ignorantly so. You know, they, I mean, I think we've all had our experiences of playing a, a marimba piece or a percussion piece in general where it's difficult because it seems like the composer didn't really understand the limitations of the instrument or perhaps just wasn't, you know, didn't, it didn't have like confident choices within the writing. And, um, you know, it's whatever. You do your best with those situations. But um, I... Uh, I really, I really enjoyed playing these because, you know, as hard as they were, as I'm trying to like frustratingly execute these like really difficult etudes, there's this little voice in the back of my head that's going, but you know, it's possible, right? you know, you can actually do it. You know, I'm going, ah, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, Doug, speaking of exactly that and really difficult, challenging pieces, you have a, you, you've had a bout with tendonitis in the past, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, Can yeah. you tell us a little about, I don't know, just maybe the story and how you overcame it and maybe advice to any, any students out there? Yeah, absolutely. So this also happened when I was in my undergrad at Peabody. And uh, I would stem this from, you know, a combination of poor practice habits and experience being, you know, as a serious practicing musician combined with uh, a lot of incitement, excitement and enthusiasm and a newfound love for you know, locking myself in a practice room, um, which basically came about, I guess, my junior year of school. Um, I reflect fondly on that being the first year where I had my own apartment all to myself. And I was so excited about that. I even I moved back to Baltimore a whole month early just so that I could live by myself. It, it was so cool. And I was right across the street from Peabody and I had all this time. So I was like, well, why not go and practice all day? And that's what I did. So I went from like, you know, a uh, sophomore scrub practicing like two or three hours a day to really putting in like, you know, pretty real hours. I'd be in there for like four or five, six hours a day, you know, at that time, which was a pretty big jump for me. But, um, I really didn't have very good practice habits. I, at that time I was taking what I call and what I tell my students, uh, is the Dragon Ball Z approach to practicing, which is the more you do it, the better you'll be right. Like, Hours right. of practice time directly translates into skill at marimba or percussion, timpani, you know, snare drum, whatever. So clearly okay. the way to become the best musician is to put the more the most hours of practicing in, uh, which if anybody here watches Dragon Ball Z, you know that that's how that show operates. It's all about, oh, how can I become the strongest? Now there's something even stronger. And, you know, eventually that show kind of ran out of juice because they, everybody got too strong and they didn't really know how to one up the, the previous bad guy or whatever. So yeah, I, I was an, practicing. That's an, that's an anime, not a video game. Yeah, that is an anime. Is that confusing to your students? I hope not. <laughs> is that confusing? <laughs> ben? I, I, I think I'm um, following, oh, yeah, I'm following sorry, so far. <laughs> yeah, you're okay. Kidding. Yeah, I mean, it, it's all it's all under the umbrella of like nerd core, you know? Nerd Have you ever heard that nerd core? Yeah. I'm sorry, but you were, you were I'm, saying something useful. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, just, I started practicing a lot which to any teacher is really great. But um, it was around Thanksgiving that I started to notice, or right before Thanksgiving, I started to notice that I, you know my arms are kind of hurting. 
Uh, I was having some pain up around my elbows and I thought, oh, it's kind of bad. Maybe I should take a break. But, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up, so I'll just take a break from Thanksgiving. You know, I'll go home, I'll eat a lot and I won't practice and then I'll come back and I'll feel better. So I did that. And then um, I uh, I got back to school and I practiced for about a week and then my arms started hurting again. And I was like, oh, well, winter break's not that far and that's a much longer break. So I'll just try to get through the rest of the semester and uh, – I'll, I won't practice over winter break. Just take it easy. You know, I'll come back and I'll be good to go. You know, so I did that. Um, and I think even by the end of winter break, I had started to like practice a little bit and wasn't really feeling any pain. So I thought everything was fine. And then the next semester it got bad. All like, I, I distinctly remember a day, um, where I went into the practice room. I didn't even play a note. I approached the marimba. I put the mallets in my hands and I just felt shocks go up both of my arms. And that was when I knew that I had a problem and that I needed help. So I eventually I ended up having to take uh, a semester off of playing completely, um, which was like with, withdrawing from lessons in the school and not not participating in orchestra or anything like that. I went through like three or four different physical therapists trying to find a solution to this. Um, and after like physical therapist three and not being a student anymore. I, I was able to like take my classes as a part-time student in my senior year, so I was able to at least get something productive done towards my degree. But by this point, it was pretty clear that I was going to have to be like a, a five-year undergrad student, do my fifth year to make up for the time lost. Um, and uh, like not long before I got to that point in my, I guess near the end of my, my what well, should have been my senior year, uh, or the first semester of my senior year, I was maybe practicing a half hour a day tops without any pain. If I went beyond that, I would start feeling pain again. And like, you know, to also be clear, this we're talking about uh, extensor and flexor tendonitis in both arms, as well as some tricep tendonitis and de Quervain's tendonitis in my right hand, which I can explain what all of those things are later. But I was basically collecting tendonitis like they were Pokemon cards. So I... um. Anime. Yeah. <laughs> so I got lucky that uh, one of the viola teachers at the school, uh, Maria Lambros, invited in a guest to do a uh, talk on, you know, musician wellness and stuff like that. His name was David Schulman. And I guess he was a physical therapist that she had seen. And he did this explanation. And it was the first person who I'd ever uh, uh, seen or like approached about uh, having an injury who talked about his treatment plan from like an incredibly sympathetic perspective to the musician. He really seemed to understand what happened to cause this injury and like specifically what was going on in the body that made this injury, uh, that made this injury present and painful and the types of things that you can do to rectify it. Whereas I think one of the, one of the therapists that I'd seen before that was special in sports medicine. So she was trying to work on me the same way that you would work on somebody who pitched the ball a little too hard and threw out their shoulder or something like that. Um, and so I started, uh, I found this guy was practicing in Baltimore. So I started, uh, having, I think like I, I was going to him three days a week, uh, getting treatments. And in my super senior year, while going to him, I was able to up my practicing from a half hour a day, a uh, day to four or five hours a day, um, without any pain and was able to play my senior recital. So wow. this guy, basically saved the day. But, but this whole experience made me think really critically about, um, well, you know, how badly did I want to do this? How badly did I want to be a percussionist? Is it really worth it? I mean, I remember, I remember the day where I sat down behind my, uh, my dog, which at the time was sonar computer, uh, like a computer program for writing music. And, uh, I was like trying to write a symphony in it because I didn't have anything else. And it was really fun and exciting. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, Maybe I don't have to be a percussionist. Maybe I can do this instead. You know, I, I was really close to, to throwing in the towel. But that whole experience made me think so much more critically about how I'm actually using my body when I play my instrument, how it actually works, what I'm actually doing to create a sound, and what do I need to know about that so that when I, not just for myself as a percussionist, but when I teach as well, what am I teaching my students to make sure that they don't go through the same thing that I did? So I learned quite a bit about 
just anatomy and basic mechanics of movement through uh, working with this physical therapist. Every time I was in a session with him, I would ask him what he was doing and what muscle that was and what it does and why he was working on it or why he'd use the different modalities that he'd use, which was, I think at the time was a combination of ultrasound, electric stim, heat and massage, um, which all did different things to help the, the healing process. And uh, so now when I teach, I a big part of my teaching is making sure that you know, when a student hits a snare drum, they know what muscles they're using, which ones do what and which ones they shouldn't be using. Because uh, I think a big part of what injured me was just a general ignorance to how uh, the mechanics of my body actually worked while playing an instrument. It also inspired me a lot to start exercising more and trying to be healthier because that all compounds itself onto onto your your musical mechanism. And that's, you know, the especially like carpal tunnel is a good example. That was the most convincing reason I ever heard to lose weight was when one of my therapists told me, well, you know, people who have a lot of weight in their arms, it's, it makes them at higher risk for carpal tunnel because there's more pressure on the, on the, on the tunnel there that, you know, can become inflamed when you have carpal tunnel. I went, Oh my God, that's the last thing I need is to have that, add that to my like Pokemon card stack, you know, of injuries. But then, um, also exercising, taking better care of myself. Oh, and also managing my time better in the practice room understanding what your muscles can do, how long they can do them for. Even just a five minute break can make or break your musical health essentially. So, um, so yeah, that happened. (laughs) Well, I had a, a, just a a quick follow up question. You've sort of already touched on it a little bit, but as a, as an interesting side note, uh, I'm sure everyone sitting here is familiar with Beethoven's Heiligenstadt Testament. But if, oh, anyone's, yeah. if anyone's not, that's a, a big one to, to look up and read about. This is when Beethoven, you know, realized he was going deaf and, you know, he was basically contemplating suicide because he was a performer and he didn't think he'd be able to perform anymore. And it changed him over to yeah. be a com- being a composer. Um, but I was just going to ask. So you said that uh, one of the things you sort of sat down that you could do while you weren't playing was compose. Did you do mm-hmm. any other I'll call it, musically productive activities like oral skills training, singing or anything like that to help uh, keep you musically in shape even though you couldn't play? Yeah. Well, it's it's funny. Um, the, uh, I actually I was taking uh, like the music history class where we got into the Heiligenstadt Testament uh, while I was injured. And uh, man, that was rough doing that homework. I think I cried <laughs> when I read that the first time. I was just like, this is way too real for me right now. But, um, but yeah, during that time, I guess the, the most productive thing I thought I could do was finish all of my classwork for my degree. So when I wasn't able to play, I just took all of the classes that I hadn't taken yet that I needed to graduate, um, which also included a poetry class. So I wrote a lot of poetry during that time. It was fun. Um, but I also, I think I, I started taking some voice lessons around that time too. Um, and that's something that I actually ended up going back to even after I finished at Peabody was, um. Uh, studying voice as well. Um, just even injury or otherwise, pedagogically, I found that studying voice made me think way more critically about sound production and tone and all of that uh, than I had thought about it while I was playing uh, pl- uh, playing percussion. Just because you know, when when a singer's working with you, you know, you 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 know, they say, okay, sing this note, and y- y- I guess the only hurdle there is intonation, right? And then you're singing the note. But then why is there this like hundred year old tradition of singing beyond that? You know, how well can you sing the one note? And uh, yeah, it's something that, you know, even now, if every once in a while a student asks me, is there another discipline that I should learn, you know, in addition to percussion? My first answer is, are you practicing enough? But then the second one is, you know, I, I would recommend, you know, maybe voice because I think it'll make you think about me, music making in a way that you haven't been thinking about it playing percussion. Yeah, I mean, me me coming to this as a non-singer for sure. I mean, with my students, I see that all the time. It's like, uh, if when you sing something, you it's really really difficult and incredibly unhealthy to sort of force any sort of phrase. I mean, you physically yeah. can't do it yeah. the way that you can yeah. with percussion instruments. And I mean, it goes back to Peter Fatso yet again. Like, if you can sing behind the marimba, it's I think it's a mm-hmm. much healthier way of playing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as percussionists, I, I, I like comparing singing and playing percussion because I think they're the most, uh, the most like carnal expressions of music making that we can do is either hitting stuff with our hands or making sounds with our throats, you know? Um, but 
what's interesting about taking voice lessons is that as a percussionist, I'm so used to like, oh yeah, you want the angle of your wrist to be a little more like this many degrees this way. And then you want to hit the drum like this many inches off the head and descriptions like this. And you absolutely cannot teach somebody to sing that way because the instruments in here, it's, I'm pointing to my neck for those of you who can't see me, uh, the instruments in here and you, you can't see it. You can't visually describe what's going on. And uh, you have to rely so heavily on metaphor and on um, demonstration. I, I, I often like my impression of the voice teachers that I had is like, you know, a, a voice lesson has them saying something to you like we're in the mystical valley of your voice. Look under that leaf. It's your F sharp. We'll leave it there. Save it for later. You know, <laughs> they do that. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, I, it's just interesting that you what you said about that idea of um, like tone production and, and and tying voice to percussion. I know that Jim Campbell, he that was like his big thing was just the idea of that. Our one of our biggest problems with percussion is the sense that we don't have to work for our sound. Right. You know, one off the street, hand them a pair of sticks, put them in front of a drum and say, make a sound. And they just, mm -hmm. OK, any idiot can do that. But then it's right. like okay, now what's a good sound versus a bad sound. And that's always been one of his big things is that like we're too, too late in the game. Are we taught that? Yeah, there's sound, but there's more importantly, there's good sound and bad sound. Yeah. You know? I, I, I want, I want to reference a, uh, um, a colleague of Casey's actually, and he's the, the bassist in my trio triple point. His name is Sam Suggs. Um, and yeah. he once, he once told me that he doesn't think of percussion as being an instrument as much as he thinks of it as being a philosophy. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I like that cause I mean, he would always notice like the percussionists are always the ones who are willing to like play weird instruments that they don't actually play because we're used to being handed a didgeridoo and saying, you have to like, you have to play a standard roll, um, throw a shoe at this tam tam and then play a note on this didgeridoo, you know? Right. So, and that's cool. We like doing stuff like that. So what I try to tell my students in that, in that mindset, going along with what you were just saying is I, I try to impress on them that they are the arbiters of sound. They are the ones who have been entrusted to decide what is the best sound that you can make when you when you like bow a violin case or something you know like what 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 is what is the best thing that you can do with this object sound wise you know that's their responsibility so whether they hit it they scrape it they shake it they blow on it it doesn't really matter they've been entrusted with the task of making the best sound possible this yeah. just makes me crack up because we have this competition here called what is it center stage competition that's like a like a soloist competition and they mm -hmm. they bring in some external judge which can be hit or miss uh and the one last year uh one of the the categories our students were evaluated on was tone and i had a student play uh george hamilton green vals and mm -hmm. the judge came in and he was like well for tone i put a 10 because you guys pretty much just pick your mallets and it seems like you picked good mallets i was like buddy i can take <laughs> that tone on a xylophone no. like, that is ah. not that is not an accurate oh, statement. No. I can show you some bad, bad tone. <laughs> that, that, that's like in line with here. If you want to play better, I have these pills. You just have to go to your doctor and get a prescription. If you take these like twice a day, you'll be able to play like, you know, your scales like nobody's business, you know? God. Well, Doug, speaking of just back to tendonitis real quick. If, yeah. If, um, and, and I get what you're saying. You know, you want to know what muscles you're using, what your muscles can do, what they can't do. If there's a student out there listening and – they maybe don't know those things and they're not sure what to do or who to talk to. Is there something that you can just listen to? Like what warning signs does your body give you before you get that zapping shooting pain you're talking about? Yeah. So, okay. Before I get too far into this, this is the part of the, the show where I should just throw out there. I am not a doctor. Um, <laughs> oh, just like right. Dr. Mario, I'm not yep. qualified to like, you know, diagnose you with anything yeah, or like give you Doug, medical advice. Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> but everything that I know about about these <laughs> everything I know about these, a, I think yeah. Brian's a doctor too. <laughs> yeah, I am not a, I'm not a doctor. Okay, and it's fine. Like, Brian and I will evaluate you on doctors. <laughs> it's, 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 funny. it's like a point of contention in my like family and professional life when my parents are like, Are you gonna get your doctorate ever? And I'm like, Mom, I wanna play concerts, you know. No, no dude, let's anyway. hold strong. Let's hold strong. We don't need it. Okay. Yeah. So okay. Basically, as far as tendonitis is concerned, what you're experiencing if you have tendonitis is the muscles in your forearm or 
wherever wherever you're experiencing the tendonitis. For a percussionist, it's normally like tennis elbow, which is um, the extensor muscle that connects to the elbow. Basically, what's happening is that your muscles are over contracted and they're so tight that they're pulling on the tendons, which do not like to be stretched. Um, so that's why you will feel the pain around the tendons, which is why it's called tendonitis. But it's important to note that if that's what you're happening, if that's specifically what's happening to you, the injury probably isn't where you're feeling the pain specifically. It's probably actually in the belly of the muscle in your forearm. So let's talk, um, basic anatomy here as human beings, everything that like the, the construction of our bodies is this wonderful, like robot made of meat that has been designed to do things in front of us, right? I mean, we, we look in front of us, we talk in front of us, we reach in front of us. Um, so, so much so that, you know, if you, if you talk to like a, a personal trainer or like a bodybuilder or something, they might describe their workout plan as alternating between working out their pushing muscles and working out their pulling muscles, because that's what we use our muscles for. We use our muscles to push things away from us or we use them to pull things closer to us. Um, and we don't typically use our pulling muscles to push things because then we would do that on the opposite side of our body and we don't do anything that way. So for that reason, um, I know we all try to astri- like strive for like perfect symmetrical beauty and all things in life, but our, our like anatomical composition isn't perfectly symmetrical. So if you look at your forearm uh, in particular, which is normally the point that uh, percussionists will get in trouble with, the muscles on the underside of your forearm, known as the flexor muscles, uh, are designed to make a fist to, to um, well, okay, we'll just start there. They're designed to make a fist. These are the muscles that you use if you need to grab something, like if you need to open the door, if you need to punch somebody to make that fist. Um, your flexor muscles are doing that. Our extensor muscles are the muscles that are designed to uh, um, pull our fingers straight out and to like, uh, uh, pull our wrists upward. So we use these to open our hands after we've opened the door. We use these muscles to open our hands after we've punched somebody in the face, whatever you're going to do with that. So for that reason, our flexor muscles are actually just by design, um, stronger, bulkier. They're prepared to do way more stuff than our extensor muscles are. Um, so now we bring in like playing percussion or playing an instrument in general. I think marimba is a great example because we have all these weird and complicated four mallet grips that, that we use, which is absolutely the last thing that um, the human body was designed to do. Um, there's nothing natural at all about playing a marimba. So as we approach a technique, we try to make it as natural as we possibly can. But what ends up happening to a lot of people, <laughs> what, what ends up happening to a lot of people who are practicing and, you know, playing, playing an instrument like marimba, which uses a complicated grip is that they end up exhausting their extensor muscles quite a bit. I mean, when you think about it, you're holding these mallets with your fingers. So you find yourself like pulling them out, um, ex- hyperextending them all the time. And, uh, that tends to exhaust those extensor muscles faster than normal. I guess, um, the, the big line there is that we're trying to, we're simultaneously trying to train these muscles with our technique, but, um, it is, easy and possible to overwhelm them through what is maybe a, a poor approach to technique or a, I don't want to say poor, a misunderstood approach to technique. And that's where you'll start to get that pulling feeling. Of course, if you start to get that pulling feeling and you start to get a lot of pain up there, your most likely reaction is to uh, compensate with a different muscle group. So then you might start playing down more. You might start using the flexor side and then you'll exhaust that side because you're making it do a bunch of other things that it's not used to doing. And that's, that's kind of how it happened for me. Um, I just started using other muscles when the muscles that I was supposed to be using started to hurt. And then, and then it all compounds on one another. So tendonitis specifically, or tennis elbow, you'll feel that on the, the, the top side of your arm, right by your elbow, typically just kind of like a, like a grating pulling pain. If you're feeling like a numbness or tingling type of pain, then that's probably a nerve issue. And that's a whole other can of worms where you might be dealing with either carpal tunnel or some sort of ulnar neuropathy, depending on which fingers you're hitting it with. And that's, it gets a little more complicated there because you're dealing with more subtle things. But what I found was the best solution for me when I was injured was like hands-on massage therapy and heat therapy. Um, basically trying to entice blood flow to these areas and break up scar tissue so that the the muscles can heal more naturally Mm -hmm. a note about scar tissue scar tissue is something that we have well you see it when you get a scar right 
you get like if somebody if somebody if you're like in a fierce argument over like who the best minimalist composer is and someone pulls a knife on you then you know <laughs> they uh you might get like a gash in your face or something and it'll heal over time but then you always have this line there it'll always they'll always have this like physical evidence of that and that's because scar tissue doesn't form in the uh the, the fibers of scar tissue don't form in the same uniform way that muscle tissue does so this happens in your arms as well in the muscles of your arms as well and once scar tissue forms it's kind of like patching over a leaky pipe with duct tape it'll do the job it'll keep the pipe from leaking um but it's not very reliable and there are probably stronger and better ways of repairing that pipe so this is what happens to a lot of people is that if they injure themselves they injure their muscles enough that they over constrict and start pulling on the uh on the tendons if they take a break scar tissue forms around the injured muscles to protect them and uh, they'll stop feeling pain for a little bit until they start doing the thing that injured them again. Because its scar tissue isn't very strong, it's more likely to break uh, quickly and reignite the injury all over again. So yeah, that's why for me uh, and for my issues, which were muscular in, in nature, actually having like hands-on massage therapy was definitely the best thing. And it's honestly something I just recommend to any musician or any person that uses their body in their work is... Getting a massage every once in a while is not necessarily a luxurious thing. It's kind of like taking your car to the shop. You just have to do it every once in a while, and you'll be better off for it in the long run. Wow, that's great, Doug. Is it um, – man, like should we just not play Steven's grip? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's inherent in the grip itself. Okay. Um, like at this point – I, I play marimba with Steven's grip. I like, you know, I, I got this injury around the time when I was starting to switch over. So I'm sure that was part of it. I had started as a Burton grip player, but I was also hurting myself playing Burton grip. A lot mm. of it comes from the unnecessary hyperextension of your fingers. So hyperextension means when you just like splay all your fingers straight out, you know, make like a make it like a flat palm, like you're going to give yourself a high five. That is your extensor muscles working overtime to keep your fingers out there. And we tend to do this by accident all the time when we're feeling meticulous when you're doing something that requires a lot of con uh concentration like playing an instrument or drinking a martini you're going to stick some fingers out and um it's just like a natural habit that we have as people when we do something that's difficult and you guys i'm sure you guys know this from like playing a difficult piece of music if you if you're like approaching a part of a piece that's hard well your your uh your typical response is to play it faster and louder you know yeah. because our brains are like this is hard this, this is going to be hard it's just going to we need to experience something that's difficult right now. And so we do this with our hands all the time. I try to encourage people from a technical perspective to try to keep your hand as close to a relaxed fist, no matter what you're doing, as much as possible, because that's the most natural position that you can that you can uh, put your hand in uh, based on the way the muscles balance with each other. You know, um, so when I when I play Steven script, you know, I try to make sure that. I'm not unnecessarily sticking any fingers out. This includes not splaying out my back two fingers when I have a really wide interval. Um, I think we've all done that when you have to play like a 15th or something because Casey wrote a stupid piece that makes you do that. Yeah, and, uh, sweet. Uh, <laughs> or like uh, when you have the yeah, active position to you, a lot of people will stick their, their index fingers out a lot or, um, you know, all sorts of things like this. Uh, just, you, you know, you have to evaluate your technique and ask, do I really need to do that right now? And is there something that feels a little more comfortable because if you just, if you get into the habit of holding your fingers that way, after a while, you're more likely to injure yourself. And I think that's part of how I injured myself. Right. Wow. Yeah. Well, man, yeah, that's really great info, Doug. It's, um, you guys, it's that time in the show where we would do our quiz, but we don't have our regular crew with us. So I've kind of prepared a different quiz because most of the Facebook questions we got, for Doug, all had to do with his appearance oh, no. and his hair in particular. <laughs> so, so we're going to play a quick game no. called Doug or Dave, and I'm just going to send you guys a photo. <laughs> no. <laughs> Can you now? You have to tell me which is which is <laughs> which is Doug and which one's Dave. If you, if you what you have to just guess because they look identical. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think. Doug's the one on the right. <laughs> uh. Well, I, that's my point. Like, who could who could tell? Here, I've got another one for you too. So yeah, listeners, we're we're this, looking at some we're looking at some photos right now. With all, I was I'm gonna like say, this here, like busting my ass to research Peter Clatsell, <laughs> and this is what Casey's doing for the podcast. I actually, I 
actually have a sound ready and I had a real quiz ready, but I, I thought, man, we're way over and I, I'll, I'll forego those things. Man, Doug, thanks so much for joining us. This was like, totally way fun. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it was a pleasure. Absolute blast. Cool, cool, cool. Well, hey, Brian, thanks for sitting in and Ben, good to see you as always. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Cool. Okay, guys, catch you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you.